to do a to do a, vi a, a visual emphasis on what he was going to preach. So he brought four jars and he put a worm in each one of them. In one of those uh, jars, the worm was put into a container of alcohol. And the second worm was put into a container of tobacco smoke. And the third one was put into a container of chocolate syrup. The fourth one was put into a, to a, a jar of clean soil, like out of the garden. At the conclusion of the sermon, the minister reported the following results. The first worm that was in the alcohol was dead. The second worm that was in the tobacco smoke was dead. The third worm in the chocolate syrup was dead. The fourth worm in the good clean soil was alive. So the minister asked the congregation, what can you learn from this demonstration? And a little old lady from the back quickly raised her hand and said, as long as you drink, smoke, or eat chocolate, you won't have worms. <laughs> True story. No, not a true story. <laughs> By the way, we still have some of these little posters of um, Pastor Walt from next for next week, and if you can put any of those somewhere that you know a business or something store or something where where people would see them, there's still a, there's still a whole week to go. Romans 13, 11 says this, And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Would you bow your heads, dear Lord, we thank you this morning for your word, the power of your word, the anointing that comes with your word. The, the power of your word has set us free, Lord, from sin and death and all the things that plague us in this world. And we just pray that this word will, will find uh, fertile ground in each heart today, Lord. And that it will cause us to do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're continuing in the book of Acts chapter 17. And as you know, the he had been in Thessalonica and he was in Berea where they were where they were eager to hear the word and examine what he said in scripture. And he was having fruitful ministry there. But some troublemakers from Thessalonica went down and stirred up opposition to Paul's mes message. So he went to Athens. Pick it up. We pick it up in chapter 17 and verse 14. Said, the believers immediately sent Paul to the coast. But Timothy and Silas stayed at Berea. And then it says in verse 15, those who escorted Paul thought him to uh, brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. So when it says that he went to the coast, we picture that he got on a boat and went to Athens, but he did not. He went overland. They escorted him down there to, to Athens overland. He had never been there there before but in verse 16 uh, it says while Paul was waiting for them in Athens waiting for Timothy and Silas to join him he needed their help while he was waiting for them he went you know he um, um, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. This distressed Paul, that the city was a completely idolatrous city. Um, while Paul was waiting for Silas and Timothy, he went sightseeing. He had never been in Athens before, all he did have some background with the educators uh, f uh, from uh, from Greece but he did have but he had never been in Athens before that we know about so he went looking around the city and this was past the golden age of Greece actually hundreds of years past the golden age of Greece which the Romans eclipsed, eclipsed the golden age of Greece but Athens was still a university center of the world it was a center of learning it was the heir of the great philosophers, uh, Plato 
and Aristotle, Pericles, Demosthenes, whose writings we still uh, read and influence people today. Sophocles, Euripides, and these were men who established patterns of thought that had effect on human learning for centuries. That was their, that was the people of Athens. That's what they did for kicks. They liked to gather around little groups and discuss philosophy and talk about what's up and what's, what's the latest news or what's the latest ideas. They liked to discuss these things. So region thought, religion, reason, thought, and logic dominated the culture of Athens. They loved to debate philosophy. They also had temples and shrines to their gods. One of the ancient writers tells us that there were 30,000 gods in Athens. 30,000. A writer, an ancient writer, said that it could be that um, it was easier to find a god than to find a man in the city of Athens. But there was, there was many idols there, possibly as there were people in that city. When people's own thoughts are the most important factor in society, they will have to invent things to worship. That's what they do. They will invent gods. They will create idols to represent the gods they have created in their own minds. When people honor their self-created gods, when they bring offerings, sacrifice, etc., you can call that now religion. We don't do religion. We're not religious, we're relational. We don't have to, we don't have to um, appease our God. We don't have religion. Religion is destructive. You know, most of Christendom is religious. Um, by their own admission, they are religious. They use that term, at least in the church we came out of and others. Religion attempts to control what God does with ritual, vestiture of the efficients and items of worship, devices used, repeated verbalisms and the like. If we say this prayer 10 times, God is obligated to bless us in this particular way. That's what they do in the, in the organization that we came from. That's what they do. There are various versions of religion, but don't say that you're religious. True believers are not religious people. We are relational people. It just, it just attempts to put God in a box and feed God with certain things, prayers and rituals, and, and, then, and then God can, and then oh, God's obligated to bless you in some way. That's religion. If you do thus and such, then God is obligated to be favorably disposed toward you. Holding touch such notions to the, as the way to God prevents the practitioner from reaching God the real way. John 14, 6 says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the real way. Paul was greatly distressed. He was aggrieved to see such barriers idol worship to the one true God. That's a barrier. Are you distressed to see the people around you worshiping idols? And it doesn't have to be that they're kneeling down before little statues. Although that's what they trained us to do as children in the religious school we went to, kneel down and pray before statues. And, and the word says, bow not thy knee before any statue, before any graven image of anything in heaven or on earth. But they trained us to do that. 
but some that you see are openly worshiping idols in church and that's what I was talking about but some are into astrology they thoroughly believe in it they don't know it but they have spiritual need they try to they try to find it in anything that seems spiritual but has no rules that's why they pursue Eastern religions. We, uh, well, I attempted, a, a, attempted, attended <laughs> a Hindu temple for two years. Some people worship their cell phones. They can't be without them. They get in a panic if they don't have their cell phones. They can't live without it. Some are addicted to social media. I see that addiction, I see that as an idol. If you're that absorbed in social media, I see it as an idol. I really do. If you worship social media by sacrificing your time to it, well, maybe you should think about how much importance Facebook and those other things is in your life. It shouldn't be that important in your life. In a way... We are in our culture like the Athenians that Paul encountered. People around us are worshiping everything but God. Amen. They have a worshipful attitude towards so many things. We don't have physical idols on every corner. Or do we? Or do we? There aren't statues like there were in Athens. Except in some churches. But people are worshiping their homes, their gardens, their vehicles, their possessions, even their activities like fishing and golf and hunting. If God isn't the most important part of your life, then you need a spiritual adjustment. <laughs> We have to live it. Not just on Sunday. We have to live it every day. Paul went into ungodly places. Every place he went was ungodly. And he tried to win some of them. In Athens, he was, he was distressed to see such an ungodly culture. I think that we are in a more ungodly culture than what Paul encountered in Athens. At least they weren't murdering babies. Continuing in verse 17, so he reasoned in the synagogues with both Jews and God-fearing Gentiles, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. As usual, Paul went to the Jews. He went to the synagogue first. In each of these places, he always went to the synagogue first because at least they had some scriptural understanding or a scriptural tradition from their um, scrolls in the synagogue, from the law and the prophets, and they had a tradition of the coming Messiah. So there was a little bit of groundwork that he could use. In the synagogues, there would be Gentiles also that were converted to Judaism. And at least the people in the synagogue would know what he was talking about. But next, it says he went in to the marketplace. That was the hubbub of people where they were discussing these ideas and thoughts about philosophy. And so he went in there. There, were, there was no... Uh, there was no preconceived ideas even of monotheism in there so he spent days he was waiting for Timothy and Silas he spent days preaching to anyone in the marketplace who would listen remember of all the places in the world this is a place where people were interested in ideas so as a matter of fact they worshipped ideas just like people do now. People have a worshipful attitude about Marxism, socialism, ideas. So when in the marketplace, he spent days in there. 
And in verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. See, they like to hear ideas, but they like to debate. Prove to me your idea, and then I'll abandon my old idea and glom on to your idea. Epicureanism followed the ideas of atomists who believed that everything was made of minuscule solid particles floating around in a void, even gods. Epicurus believed were made solely of matter. And they had a four-part cure. One was don't fear God. Second one, don't worry about death. Third one, what, what is good is easy to get, and what is terrible is easy to endure. That was the Epicurean philosophy. Epicurean physics was intertwined with Epicurus's philosophy. Everything is matter, so whatever soul people may have disappears when the body dies. There's no afterlife. Therefore, there's no reason to fear the judgment of the gods in the afterlife. In fact, the gods not only ignore human affairs, they are in such a state of peace and contentment, they don't even realize humans exist. Therefore, there's no need to try to appease them on earth. That was Epicureanism. That was one of the two philosophies that Paul was engaged with in the marketplace. The other one was Stoicism. According to this teaching, as social beings, the path to what they call eudaimonia which is happiness or blessedness is found in accepting the moment as it presents itself by not allowing oneself to be controlled by the desires for pleasure or by the fear of pain by using one's mind to understand the world and to do one's part in nature's plan and by working together and treating others fairly and justly that's what the stoic philosophy was and stoicism they didn't want uh, conditions that were happening to you to, to bother you. So that was just where that term stoic comes from. Debate was the favorite pastime of the Athenians. They loved to argue different points of view. The, Epic the, uh, uh, the um, uh, Epicureans and the Stoics had totally different points of view, and they were both listening to what Paul had to say, which was so foreign to them, they could scarcely even wrap their minds around it. So some of them, in verse 18, some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? It was just so beyond what their, what their outlook for things was. Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said, uh, they said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Paul's message was so foreign to their thinking that they were confused. I don't see any reference in their philosophies to sin. There is no concept of sin. Instead of the one true God, Jehovah, the Athenians had a pantheon of many gods. Some of the philosophies thought that the gods interfered in the affairs of men and the favor of the gods could be gained with offerings, festivals, rituals, building temples and shrines. As you know, the Parthenon, is, it, that's in Athens, and the Parthenon was a temple, I think, to Zeus, and it was on the Acropolis, a big high hill. It's, most of it's still there. The columns are still there. But they had lots of stuff like that and lots of gods. Athena, that, that Athens is named after. Verse 19, then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. 
The Areopagus was a hill in Athens that was covered with stone seats where philosophers and other leaders uh, would have meetings and discussions. The hill was also known as Mars Hill after the Romans came in there. That was a Roman name for that hill. Areopagus also refers to a group of leaders and thinkers who met on the hill. So Paul was brought or invited to speak before them and explain what he was speaking in the marketplace. He was probably really excited to have this invitation because he was just talking to whoever would listen in the marketplace. Now he's got an audience of let's say city leaders and philosophical leaders and people who are curious about anything he might have to say. He's got an audience. A preacher needs an audience. <laughs> and he's got an audience. Verse 20. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. And it continues, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. How they made a living baffles me if they spent all their time talking about ideas. I don't know how they made a living, but that's what it says. Verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in any, any way you are very religious. <laughs> So Paul's opening statement was very crafty. He seemed to compliment them, but being religious wasn't really a compliment from Paul. He just said, I see you're very religious. And they probably thought, well, yeah, he, th he thinks we're great because we're religious. But he needed an opening. He needed a little parting of the curtain to get in there. So that's what he used. And he was talking about the altar to the unknown God. That was a way to introduce the gospel. So he stood up and he said, People of Athens, I see you're very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription. It said, To an unknown God. So you were ignorant about the very thing you worship. In other words, you don't know because it's unknown. You don't know that God that you worship. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. Now that must have got their attention. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Exactly what would appeal to people who were so consumed with learning. You are worshiping what you don't know. <laughs> this would have piqued their interest. He's going to explain to us something we don't know. He's going to tell us about the unknown God. They loved to learn new things. Now I, will, now I will explain it to you. He says, listen to this. And Paul goes on to explain about the creator, God, that does not live in temples made by human hands and is not represented by items of silver and gold. Thus the message was so different from anything they had ever heard their philosophers saying the unknown God was the giver of life, the creator God. And in verse 34 it says, Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, and also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Not only that, but Paul um, told them that God's will is that all people would seek him and find him. Seeking you. God seeking you. They had this idea that the gods didn't matter. They, they had idols and stuff, but, they, but this was the one true creator God seeking you. Then he spoke about the resurrection, and some of them sneered. Always some do. Oh, always. It's still that way. But some became followers. There will always be a small number that will believe and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And there will always be many who refuse to believe. 
who are not open-hearted to the message of the gospel and who will not be. Some of them will have a time, a day of grace, when God will appeal to them by the power of the Holy Spirit and send a person to speak the words of truth to them. And some refuse to believe. It's a cry in shame. It's a cry in shame. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. My brothers and sisters, you are the few. You are the few. Only a few find it. Consider yourself extraordinarily blessed yes. because you are the few in the world. Paul was working to get as many on that narrow road as possible. You're automatically on the wide road that leads to destruction. But he never let an opportunity pass without sharing the gospel. He made the most of every opportunity. Be careful in Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Paul worked in cultures that were so different from his, vastly different. They couldn't wrap their head around what he was saying. Neither can we. Because salvation is something, isn't something you wrap your head around. It's something you wrap your heart around in faith. You can't understand it. Why would God send his son of God, which is also God, come to earth, put up with people for 30 years, then go around blessing people and then allow himself to be tormented, tortured, abused and sacrificed and killed. Why would God do that? It doesn't make any sense. You can't wrap your head around it. You can in your head realize that it happened, but you have to wrap your heart around it in faith. That's how you have to believe and receive. So did Jesus make the most of every opportunity. How about the Samaritan woman at the well? He's just sitting there. And he told her that about living water. And she says, where can I get this living water? And he explained to her that it was him. And she ran to the city. I have a sermon I preach called Leave the Jug. She left her water jug. What her material purpose was that day was to go out there and get some water and bring it back. There was no well in town. You had to go out there and get your water. And she left the jug and ran back in the city and said, I found the Messiah. And the whole town came out. And they, they, they wanted him to go in town and stay with them. And a whole lot of them turned away from the way of the Samaritans and became Christian believers because he made the most of that opportunity. And he makes the most of an opportunity in each life if someone would just turn and believe. Now we live in an idolatrous culture. We don't see altars and shrines almost all over the town as Paul did. But the culture is maybe even more idolatrous than the culture of Athens. People are worshiping trucks. People are worshiping their lawn. People are worshiping guns and fishing poles. People are worshiping each other, anything but God. It doesn't show, but idolatry is everywhere. Sometimes it's in churches. Whatever you wrap around your heart in a, heart around in a devoted way is taking the place that only God deserves on the pedestal of your heart. There is no room for two gods in your life. <laughs> Matthew 6:24, no one can serve two masters. 
Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Mammon is referred to in the King James. Nothing can take the place of God in your life or in your heart. The culture that we live in is ungodly, just like the culture of Athens was. Paul carried his light, the truth of the gospel, into that dark city was considered by the world to be a brilliant city because of all the philosophy and but it was a dark city just like our culture is becoming very very dark he used an opening to share the light he had to have an opening with these people because it was totally foreign he could go into a synagogue and there would be an opening because they knew about the messiah and he just proclaim that the messiah has come some accepted it some said no he hasn't and they're still saying that today and i have personally known jewish people who have accepted the messiah i, I have known several of them it's a glorious thing but the opening was provided by God, that opening. And it still is provided. Paul took the time to look around and see what he might use to see what opening God might provide. We encounter ungodly people everywhere. People existing in spiritual darkness. Some of them are religious, but they're still in the dark. They're all around us. Sometimes it shows, and sometimes it doesn't. The soul winner has to be on the lookout for opportunities like Paul was. You shouldn't witness to everyone that you see. You would just drive them away. We did that when we first got saved. Everybody got a load, but you just, you just offend them and drive them away. Paul was a seeker of souls. Without the pleading of the Holy Spirit, you can preach till you're blue in the face to no avail, till you're blue in the face. There's a time for the sinner, that particular sinner. There's a time when the pleading of the Holy Spirit is on that person and the soul winner comes along and in partnership with God, share the word, lead a person to the Lord. And I've had so many of those opportunities and you can tell who's going to accept him and who's not. You can tell if you're in the right place at the right time and that person needs God and the Holy Spirit is at work in them and you're the partner and you bring the word and the Holy Spirit brings conviction, pulls down the veil in their hearts. You can tell. You can tell. And not just ministers, all of you can tell. You know, I've, I've led many people to the Lord before I was ever a minister. Let them on the telephone. Let them in person. Salvation is too good to, for us to keep it to ourselves. So like Paul, and let's be on the lookout for opportunities. He was in the marketplace trying to see what's going on, trying to see what these people were about, trying to find something he could use. There's a time for the sinner. There's a time. We operate in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord of the harvest. Matthew 9, starting in verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they're harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Do you want to be one of those workers? Do you want to keep salvation to yourself? <laughs> no. Well, I can't answer for you, but I don't. Ask the Lord of the harvest, Jesus said. 
Ask, who's the Lord of the harvest? Jesus himself. Ask the Lord of the harvest. In other words, he's saying, ask me. Ask Jesus. And Jesus himself will use you. Ask him to make opportunities for you to carry your light into dark places. The world's all darkness except where we are. It is. It's dark. The hearts are dark. That's why the things are going on in this country the way they are. People have closed out the light. And they're starting to try to, not starting, they've been doing, try to decide everything on their own self, their own logic, their own what makes sense to them. And they're getting way off of being oriented toward God's will. Way off. Well, we have to appeal to them one at a time. Each of us needs to do that. It, it's not going to change if we don't do that. We can hope that an, uh, an awesome evangelist will come and, and uh, throngs will come and get saved. We can hope that there will be a, a great revival across the country. And I believe there will be. But that doesn't, uh, that doesn't let me off the hook of a one-to-one -one sharing the gospel. It doesn't let me off the hook. I'm still responsible. You make me work for those. You know that. You make me work for those. That's why I sleep all afternoon when I go home. Because I've worked so hard up here. <laughs> Actually, the labor is getting the, it's just trying to get the thoughts that the Lord is leading down so I can share them with you. But, but we need to be, we need to be the workers in the harvest. We need to be soul winners. There's nothing hard about it. You've all been saved, so you can just share that. I've told you before, my first convert was my sister. It was probably only a week after I got saved. I called her on a phone, told her all about it. Do you want to do that? Yeah, I want to do that. I led her to the Lord on a phone. I was only a week saved. It was so thrilling. And I signed up to be a telephone counselor on it. They had a localized version of the 700 Club in Hartford, Connecticut, and I was on the telephone. I was just a new Christian. I said, I don't know much. I said, you don't know much. Just be able to, people call in and you pray for them. Led people to the Lord on the phone. I was just a baby Christian. Just a baby, you know. But I knew some scriptures. You just have to know. I used four scriptures to get somebody to, to witness to somebody. You can use the Roman road, but I just use four scriptures, basic, four basic scriptures, and then have a version of the sinner's prayer. That's all you need, but you need to be willing and ask Jesus to help you encounter someone that needs God. And when you see him, going after that one, I'll get, I'll get, I'll get that one. But sometimes that's not the one. It's not their time. And then you walk away. But I, I, can, I can tell. I know. But there's nothing like that. Leading someone to the Lord. There's nothing like that. It's, it's addicting. And after a while. I haven't led anyone to the Lord for a while. And... Um, so I remind the Lord, I, I need to do that, Lord. I need to have an encounter with a sinner. I need to bring a, bring a sinner my way, one that's ready to go. That's what I asked. The last person I led to the Lord was Ashley, Ashley, whose uh, wedding I officiated. She had a, she, her and her fiance had a meeting with me downstairs in this church, and I. And he was already a born-again believer, he said. And I asked her, and she said, no, she wasn't. I explained it to her. You want to do that? Yes. A letter to the Lord, right down here in the basement. Not because I'm anything special. I'm nothing. There's nothing that any of you can't do. There's the challenge for you. Be prepared. Look for opportunities like Paul did. 
and then just do it. Once you do that, you're going to get addicted to it. You're going to want another one and another one. The first year I came here, I was able to lead nine people to the Lord. The second year, two. This year, last year, maybe two. This year, only one. But the year's not over yet. I'm asking the Lord to bring some sinners in here. If you know some sinners, bring them in here. Bring them in here. I need to talk to them. I need to do that. Ah, and so do you. And so do you. Ah, can we gather down here? I'm going to pray for people's needs today. Today. Don't forget to, uh, I have some of these posters, if you can post.